Hey, Merry Sunday after Christmas, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice Christmas. But you know, I'll bet it wasn't as good as the one back in 97. Or it was your greatest Christmas ever in 04. You know, some of us have this tendency to romanticize our past. And I think this is especially true at Christmas. We remember back fondly to the year when it snowed. Oh, but it was just a little snow, no mud with this snow, but enough for the kids to play in and build a snowman. All the kids came home for Christmas. There was piles of presents under this perfect silver tip Christmas tree. You know, the breakfast bread was awesome. You know, fruitcake was even good this year, right? You went to church, sang all the old songs. The pastor wasn't too long-winded. The ravioli turned out great. Uncle Henry didn't get drunk this year. It was a perfect day, right? We have this idyllic image of Christmas. But then there's this tension because it doesn't really match. It doesn't now and it didn't then. We're just good at forgetting unpleasant stuff. Because we've done the same thing with our Christmas story. Mary and Joseph starting off their life together. The beginning of a great adventure. Riding a donkey to Bethlehem, the birthplace of the great King David. Finding a little secluded stall to give birth in. And of course, it was a beautiful birth. No screaming or tearing or blood. There's fresh stall, straw in the stall and the cattle are lowing. The poor baby wakes but doesn't cry, right? Beautiful birth. Shepherds show up. Wise men bring gifts. You know, this is the stuff of a Hallmark movie, am I right? But what in the world does it have to do with real life? You know, and it occurred to me that when we romanticize Christmas and those... Uh, those of us whose lives are less than perfect seem to feel like odd men out. And this spills over into our Christianity. What does Christianity even have for me if it's full of perfect people with their lives all together? They have no messes, no problems. Uh, you know, I think there should be a bucket of mud under the Christmas tree to remind us you know, of this first Christmas. It wasn't quite what we've imagined any more than that perfect Christmas that we've romanticized in our minds. That first Christmas was pretty messy. And in the words of Paul Harvey, I want to give you the rest of the story now. So we have two accounts of the birth of Jesus, one given to us by Matthew, and this is a Jewish perspective, and one from the Gentile Dr. Luke. And being a Gentile or non-Jewish, he misses some of the subtleties of the stories. Uh, and these two accounts were first combined into uh, these Christmas nativity scenes that we have today in the 12th century by St. Francis of Assisi. And this blended Hallmark version is what has been impressed on us as the real Christmas story. But it's a cleaned up version and doesn't tell it all and adds a lot of stuff that's not there or the timing is all off. You know, Luke in his narrative starts out with the birth of John the Baptist. He's born to an old couple. Um, Zachariah, John's dad, is uh, told by an angel they're going to have a kid. And Zach, in his disbelief, questions the angel and is made mute. A great start to the story, right? Old and dude doesn't believe and is mute, and his antique wife turns up pregnant. Oh, what a messy beginning, huh? The Christmas story is not off to a very auspicious beginning. Scandal. Uh, next, the angel comes to Mary and tells her, Oh, favored one, you're going to have a baby. The Bible doesn't tell us, but you can imagine what must have been going on in Mary's mind. Uh, what? You know, if this is how the old favored one gets treated, man, take me off the nice list. A lump of coal for Christmas will be just fine. I'm not married. I'll be the object of ridicule and disgrace. My fian fiancé will divorce me before we're ever married. Uh, that's assuming he doesn't have me stoned first. Or my dad doesn't kill me. Oh, what a mess. We don't have any record of that. But what we have in Luke's account, <laughs> uh, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. Wow, what a cleaned up version, huh? And Joseph now gets a visit from an angel who tells him to go ahead and take the girl, even though, in the words of Michael Jackson, that kid is not my son. Huh? Oh, what a mess. All the hopes they had of a normal life. You know, 2.5 kids, a white picket fence, a minivan. Uh, well, maybe not a minivan. I don't think anyone dreams of a minivan. But, you know, all their hopes and dreams of a normal life are all gone. Oh, what a glorious night. Oh, no. It was more like, what a mess. Gloom, despair, and agony on us. So the census rolls around, 
and Joseph takes Mary and they get out of Dodge, away from the stairs and the accusations, and they head to Bethlehem because this is where his family is from. Now, there's no mention of anyone going with them, even though the rest of Joseph's family had to go too. Now, census meant one thing in those days, taxes. Oh, joy to the world, more taxes. Ah. It was about 80 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and there was no donkey mentioned either. That was another St. Francis of Assisi moment. Thank you, G. Thank you, sir. Uh, they just walked the 10 or 12 miles a day. Yeah, you know, I wonder. I think they even talked on the trip. Uh, that kid is not my son on this continual loop in Joseph's head. The shame, the disgrace. Oh, what a mess. Then the, they get there, and the Bible doesn't say that she went right into labor as they roll into town. But it says, while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. They could have been there days or even weeks before. You know, and I would like to interject a little Jewish perspective here. We got to go to Israel this year, right before COVID hit. And we got to experience life from a Jewish perspective. Let me give you a quick example. And now don't judge me. But we went to a wine tasting. And the young gal who hosted the event was actually the winemaker. And she worked in this kosher winery. Man, she was delightful. And you could tell she really loved making her wine. It was like she was sharing her creations with us. Now, I had no idea what could make a winery kosher. You know, were the grapes slaughtered in the proper fashion? Was there blood let out by a rabbi? You know, <laughs> what? So I asked. And she told us a, a kosher winery, in a kosher winery, a kosher winery, no woman could touch the wine, not even a wine barrel, or it would be ruined to make it impure. It'd only be fit for us Gentiles to drink. She had to have men draw the wine from the various barrels to sample. She couldn't collect the sample herself. Now that sounds so offensive to us, but she took it right in stride. It's just the way it's always been. See this idea of ritual purity and cleanliness. You know, why I'm bringing this up is Luke says, there was no place for them in the inn. Now that's different than the Hallmark St. Francis Assisi version. What, you know, what we see in the Sunday school plays where they get into town and start, start knocking on doors. Uh, Luke 2, six says, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And we got some interesting insight from our Bethlehem guide. See, our regular guide was not allowed there. Um, so our guide in Bethlehem was actually a Muslim. Uh, he was a Muslim Christian. We had lunch at his house and he prayed before the meal. And it was, he was well versed in Jewish customs. And because he was a guide for Bethlehem, he was well schooled on the birth narrative. He talked about how this ritual purity was very important in the first century Bethlehem, just as much as it is in a 21st century winery. Our guide said Mary couldn't have the baby in the house without making the whole house unclean. Now, if you've been involved in a birth, it's messy, blood and goo, goo gushing out everywhere, uncleanliness everywhere. And if she gave birth there in the house, it would make the whole house unclean. Everything she touched would be unclean. He talked about how every plate she touched would be um, unclean and need to be thrown away. He can't just run it through the dishwasher on sandy wash. No, it would have to be thrown away. Uh, they would take and set the plate on the ground for the woman. They were not even allowed to touch the plate at the same time. Then after she used it, it would be taken outside to a designated area and smashed in ceremonial fashion. This would go on for 80 days if she had a girl and 40 days if it was a boy. So having a baby in the house that was not your own would create a lot of expense and a lot of work for a host family. <laughs> Better to give birth in your own house or if you're visiting, make sure they had lots of dishes, right? But the poor people in the house where they were staying, who were most likely Joseph's extended family, had no choice. Man, we love you, cuz, but you got to get that prego time bomb out of here before she gives birth and makes the whole place unclean. <laughs> what a mess. What are they going to do? You know, that scenario makes a little more sense than everyone in town being so insensitive that they would turn away a pregnant woman. Now, also, she did not give birth in St. Francis' nativity scene. Uh, this is something he brought into the church in the 12th century. There was not a stable with nice, clean bedding straw, but a cave was where little baby Jesus was born. You know, we might think it's strange, but people have lived in caves throughout history. Until just a couple hundred years ago, they were desirable places to live. 
Typically, the animals would be pushed to the back of the cave and their body heat would, would warm the cave and the people would live in front where the smoke from their cooking fires could escape. This is where Mary and Joseph came to give birth. Oh, what a mess. Born in the dirt of a cave. We, got, we actually got to go down into this cave. Uh, whether it was an actual spot or not, we'll never know. But in the 4th century, Constantine's mom came to the Holy Lands and located all the sites. And, and this cave was where they built the church in 380. So this is where St. Francis, Francis of Assisi came. This is not where the little drummer boy came. Sorry, he's not in the story, right? This is not where the wise men, who were not kings, the we three kings at all, but were astrologers. And we don't know how many there were, but that there were just three gifts mentioned. Most likely there was 20 or more in the caravan because it was dangerous to travel in smaller groups. But they didn't come to the cave where Jesus was born, but to a house. And it might have been two years later because Herod had all the baby boys in Bethlehem and the surrounding area who were two years and younger in accordance with the time the wise men saw his star. He had them all killed. And this fulfilled the ancient prophecy from Jeremiah. Rachel weeping for her children but refusing to be comforted because they were all dead. Oh, what a mess. The nativity scene is getting sparse, isn't it? The shepherds did come and, found, and find him wrapped in a swaddling cloth and placed in a manger there by Mary. You know, when it, we look at the story closely, it says she gave birth. You know, this is implying she didn't have any help. It was not call the midwife and boil some water. And there was nobody to call. Can you imagine how scared she must have been? Her mom wasn't there. Maybe no one to help. Poor thing, man. She gave birth. And she wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a feeding trough. I'm guessing Joseph wasn't much good. She was doing this all on her own. This was not how she envisioned her life to be. She was supposed to have a baby with her mom and her aunt helping. It was supposed to be a happy time nine months after the wedding or so. Not like this. Oh, what a mess. And after she gave birth, she put the baby in the feeding trough. And I just find this is a very unnatural thing for her to do. People try and rationalize why she put the baby in the feeding trough. You know, it was dirty, maybe muddy. This was a spot out of the mud. Man, but in my family, a baby laying by itself is a wasted baby. Babies are meant to be held. And moms are glad they breastfeed because at least every couple hours, the baby comes back to her to hold. So why wasn't Mary holding her baby, keeping him warm and nursing him? Why would you lay your newborn baby in a manger? You know, maybe she didn't even know why she did this. It seems like the thing to do at the time, but maybe it was just so it could be a sign for the shepherds, a demonstration of his humble origins. And maybe it's a sign for us too, as the manger is a place where God's creatures come to eat. So too we could come to the manger, come into Jesus' presence. You know, he said, take, this is my body given for you. We're to feast on Jesus, take him in just like we would food. Let him sustain us through all the messy times in life. You know, Bethlehem actually means house of bread. Isn't it fitting that the bread of life was born there? The messy, dirty, smelling feeding trough, feeding trough was a sign to show the shepherds that this is where the Savior of the world would be. And it was a welcome sign for Mary and Joseph, too. This is what God would ordain. <laughs> what strange confirmation, huh? You know, thanks to St. Francis and Hallmark, we have a nice, clean version of Christmas. But it was anything but. But we like things nice and neat and tidy, don't we? We want order and purpose and meaning to everything. But maybe, just maybe, God does his best work in the messiness of life. What if the confirmation of the kingdom of God is that things get harder and messier? And maybe the opposite of what we wanted. More humbling than we ever expected. When our dreams are falling apart and when life seems to have kicked the snot out of us, Maybe then we might be exactly where God wants us to be and where he can use us the most because in our weakness, he is made strong. Suffering and mourning our losses highlight our weaknesses. It's messy and humbling. And it's here that God is glorified. So when we look at the nativity scene, picture in your mind a young, scared couple. And maybe they haven't had a bath since it rained last. 
They had to go to the cave to have the baby so as to not make the house, any houses unclean. And they were there alone. No wise guys, no drummer boy, no midwife, no family. All their hopes and dreams for, for a normal life gone. All their respectability gone. All the security of family and home gone. Oh, what a messy, glorious night. Because God was there. God was right there in the mess. You know, we've added a lot into the Christmas story, romanticized it quite a lot. You know, maybe that's why John's Christmas story is my favorite. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, I guess, you know, why I'm bothered by our Hallmark, Hallmark version of the story is when we clean it up, um, everyone whose life feels a mess feels that maybe Christianity is not for them. That Christianity is only for perfect people with perfect lives. <laughs> what does God want with my messy life? But Jesus stepped into human history on a messy, glorious night. And his humble beginnings prove that God is there for us, even in the messiest parts of our lives. And just like Christmas is for everyone, so Christianity is for everyone. And God is most glorified when we are at our weakest. Because... In our weakness, he is made strong. Love you guys. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>